Hello, this is Dr. Grande. Today's question asks if I can analyze the mental health and personality factors that may be at work in the case of John Wheeler III. This is an unsolved homicide that was featured on the Netflix series, Unsolved Mysteries, the first episode of season two. Just a reminder, I'm not diagnosing anybody in this video, only speculating about what could be happening in a situation like this. If you enjoy this video, please like it, subscribe to my channel, and consider supporting me on Patreon. I'll put the link to Patreon in the description for this video. So first, I'll take a look at the background of John Wheeler, move to the timeline of the crime, the mental health and personality factors, and then I'll talk about what I think happened in this case. So starting with the background, John Wheeler was born in Laredo, Texas on December 14, 1944. In 1966, he graduated from the United States Military Academy, also known as West Point. He was stationed at a base in New Jersey before going to Harvard Business School. He would graduate there in 1969. He had a number of positions, including working as a systems analyst for the Office of the Secretary of Defense and serving on the general staff at the Pentagon. In 1972, he attended Yale Law School and graduated in 1975. After this, he had a number of other positions, working as an attorney at a law firm, working for the Securities and Exchange Commission. He was a consultant for some time. He had a lot of positions with high-profile organizations. At the time of his death, he was working as a consultant. He was instrumental in raising money to build the Vietnam Veterans Memorial. Wheeler had been married twice. He was married to his second wife for 13 years at the time of his death. His second wife said that he was not suited to domestic life. They were apart more than they were together. It was reported that Wheeler had bipolar disorder and took medications to treat it. He was hospitalized in 2004 during a manic phase. He often traveled to Washington, D.C. for work. He and his wife had a home in New York City and Newcastle, Delaware. Now moving to the timeline of the crime. Around Christmas of 2010, Wheeler was in New York City with his wife. When she woke up on the morning of December 28, Wheeler was gone. His wife was not happy about this, but expected him to come back a few days later so they could attend a wedding. Wheeler had taken a train to Washington, D.C. While there, he ate at a restaurant around midday. He then took a train to Wilmington, Delaware. Wilmington is just north of Newcastle. His wife tried to reach him on December 29 on his cell phone, but he did not answer. That same day, he sent an email to the place where he was functioning as a consultant, telling them that his cell phone and other items were gone. At no time did he notify the authorities. At 6 p.m., he was seen in a pharmacy not far from his home in Newcastle, he was looking for a ride to Wilmington. The pharmacist offered to call him a cab. Other people overheard the conversation and may have given him a ride. He was also asking for a ride to Philadelphia. It was not perfectly clear how he ended up there, but he arrived at a parking garage in Wilmington and said he was looking for his vehicle, but he was in the wrong parking garage. One of his shoes was ripped and he was carrying it in his hand. He mentioned his briefcase had been stolen, he denied he was intoxicated, and he appeared disoriented and disheveled. It was reported that Wheeler had a bad sense of direction. He had forgotten where he parked on prior occasions as well, and sometimes he would forget his car was in the parking lot altogether, like he would take a cab home from the train station when his car was actually available at that location. He left the parking garage and made his way to downtown Wilmington, probably in a cab. It's believed he spent the night of December 29 indoors, perhaps in the basement of an office building. Witnesses said he ate at a Subway restaurant around 8 a.m. on December 30. He looked like he was homeless. His shirt was dirty, and he wasn't wearing a winter coat, even though it was freezing outside. He visited a law office in the afternoon and an office for the Small Business Administration. There, he asked an employee for a ride to Philadelphia, stating he was a fellow federal employee. When they asked which agency he worked for, he walked away. There were also reports that he was trying to get to New York City or Washington. He was seen exiting the Nemours building at 8.39 p.m. on December 30. Over the course of his travels in Wilmington, many people offered to help him, but he refused. It is believed that around 11 p.m., he took a cab to Newark, Delaware, 
which is about 14 miles from Wilmington. The police are not positive about this. He may have made his way to Newark by some other method. The police believe that Wheeler was beaten to death in Newark or perhaps in Wilmington and placed in a commercial trash bin in Newark. On December 31, at 9.56 a.m., his body was found at the Cherry Island Landfill in Wilmington when it fell out of a garbage collection vehicle that had collected trash in the Newark, Delaware area. He died from blunt force trauma. He had a punctured lung, broken ribs, and bleeding in the head. The police gave conflicting reports to his wife about him having a heart attack after he was beaten. Wheeler had cash on him, a Rolex watch, and a ring from West Point. His briefcase was never located. His cell phone was found across the street from his residence in Newcastle in a home that was under construction. Wheeler had been in a dispute with the people who were building that home. Someone matching Wheeler's physical description had deployed smoke bombs there at about 11.30 p.m. on December 28, the day that Wheeler came back from Washington, D.C. These smoke bombs are the ones that are used to repel animals, like gophers or woodchucks. The police wanted to talk to Wheeler about that incident. It makes sense that they believed he was a suspect. Separate of Wheeler's disappearance, a neighbor had called the police about Wheeler's residence in Newcastle. There were broken plates in the sink, cleaner on the floor, and Wheeler's West Point ceremonial sword was out of the scabbard. Nothing had been stolen from his house. Now moving to the mental health and personality factors. As I mentioned, it was reported that Wheeler had bipolar disorder. This disorder can manifest in a variety of ways, but it always has mania and most of the time depression as well. As individuals with bipolar disorder age, it is not unusual that there are fewer manic episodes and more depressive episodes. Some people describe Wheeler as having symptoms of Asperger's, which is now known as autism spectrum disorder. He was never diagnosed with the disorder, but they said he had difficulties in social situations, but functioned at a high level cognitively. He was described as absent-minded, like he would drive right by his house, lost in thought. This is consistent with having a poor sense of direction. It's like he was too focused on some other task and lost sight of completing daily activities. Evidently, that dispute with the people building the house across the street was because their house was partially blocking his view of Battery Park, a park located in Newcastle. This seems like an odd reason to get involved in a dispute. It seems like it indicates rigid thinking. It's also peculiar because he didn't seem to spend a lot of time looking out of the window at Battery Park. One neighbor said that he had only spoken to Wheeler one time. He said the television would be on at a high volume in Wheeler's house, but it didn't look like anybody was home. As far as personality, there's not a lot of information available. The reports seem to indicate that Wheeler may have been low in extroversion and low in agreeableness. So what do I think happened in this case? Well, here's my theory on the case. This theory, of course, could be wrong. It seems likely that we'll never know what happened with any level of certainty. So again, hypothetically, Wheeler enters into a manic phase of bipolar disorder and has psychotic symptoms. A key part of psychosis is often paranoia. This amplifies his feelings about the current dispute he has with the people building the house across the street. He throws the smoke bombs into that house, knowing that the stench from the smoke will make their lives difficult. As the manic phase intensifies, he becomes disorganized, leaving his cell phone there. He walked back to his house. He was frustrated and confused. He breaks dishes, rifles through his kitchen, perhaps looking for the cell phone. The paranoia and perhaps anger drive him to retrieve the ceremonial sword. He then becomes hyper-focused on getting to his vehicle so he can travel to Philadelphia, New York City, or Washington. He may have wanted to confront somebody there, or it could have been the paranoia, like he was trying to escape to some place he thought was safer than Newcastle or Wilmington. As Wheeler is walking in Wilmington, people offer to help him, but no one calls the authorities because he's well-dressed and perhaps they believe he's simply intoxicated. At some point, he makes his way to Newark. I think it makes sense that he took a cab, but again, the police haven't figured out how he did that. 
So here is where this divides into three theories, all of which take place in Newark, Delaware. The first theory, Wheeler is assaulted by an individual who is not intent on robbing him. Perhaps the two just ran into one another and the assailant became aggravated, perhaps as the result of Wheeler being antagonistic or paranoid. After the assault, Wheeler climbed into a metal dumpster. He was injured, cold, and frightened. He was killed as a result of being dropped out of the dumpster into the truck and being crushed by the compactor. The second theory, the individual who attacked him caused his death. This homicide was probably unintentional and not a robbery. Scared, the assailant throws Wheeler's body in a dumpster, not realizing they actually increased their chances of being caught by making more contact with the body and offering other opportunities to be spotted by witnesses or captured on camera. The assailant made no effort to put the body in any type of bag to decrease the chances of the body being found. This was not a professional assassin or something like that, but a local resident of Newark who had a chance encounter with Wheeler. The third theory, Wheeler, confused, agitated, and paranoid, became cold and climbed into the metal dumpster to get warm. He was killed as a result of being dropped in the truck and crushed. So which theory do I think is most likely? It's really hard to say without looking at the autopsy. Blunt force trauma is not highly specific and can be caused by non-human forces. The police seem fairly sure he was attacked, so based on that, I would have to say the second theory is the most likely. He was murdered and somebody put his body in the dumpster. If the autopsy revealed that there was blunt force trauma that was not specific to a human assailant, I would say the third theory makes the most sense. He climbed into the dumpster and was killed again by being dropped in the truck and crushed. Here's why this case is so confusing. The confusion, paranoia, goal directedness, and agitation fit with the manic episode, but usually these different symptoms would be fairly clear to people and they would intervene. Somebody normally would have called the police. I think what happened here was that Wheeler was able to avoid aggravating other people, avoid attracting an excessive amount of attention. He was accustomed to managing bipolar symptoms and his ability to control his behavior made it so others were not alarmed. This, of course, doesn't predict his death. If he was doing a good job and not seeming out of control and dangerous, why was he attacked? So what about the theory that Wheeler was targeted by an assassin? I don't think this really makes any sense at all. Everything he did put him more at risk. Wandering around Wilmington at night, not carrying any type of weapon, not accepting help, not calling the police. How likely is it that an assassin would just happen to target Wheeler when Wheeler was having pronounced mental health symptoms and wandering around Newark or Wilmington? This would have to be one lucky assassin. Did the assassin provoke the dispute between Wheeler and the neighbors? Why would the assassin put the body in the dumpster and not take additional steps to make sure the body was not recovered? So again, I don't think the assassin theory is too likely. What can we learn here in terms of this case? When dealing with severe mental illness, one can increase their level of safety by having continual contact with others. So being alone, like in this case he was away from his wife, is not really a good idea when there's a possibility of a major mood episode. Second lesson, when somebody refuses help, that doesn't mean they don't need help. I think these two ideas often get confused. Those are my thoughts on the John Wheeler case. Please put any opinions and thoughts in the comment section. They always generate an interesting dialogue. As always, I hope you found my analysis of this topic to be interesting. Thanks for watching. So a side note with this case, I found this interesting because this case took place in Delaware. When my family first moved to Delaware, I lived in Newark for 18 years, then Newcastle, Delaware for 10 years, and I've lived back in Newark for almost 18 years after that. I've never lived in Wilmington, but I've been there many times. I went to high school in Wilmington and have visited hundreds of different businesses and people there over the last 45 years. I've been to just about every place that was shown in the Netflix special. The Nemours Building, Battery Park, Cherry Highland Landfill, the train station in Wilmington. There's something quite different when a case is connected to where you live. For example, in the Netflix documentary, they said that Wheeler's home was in Newcastle City. 
which is technically correct, but no one calls it that here. The area that he was in is called Old Newcastle. It has homes that were built during colonial times. It's much different than the rest of Newcastle, like where I lived. So I just wanted to point that out. I thought it was interesting that there was an Unsolved Mysteries episode about a Delaware case. It's a small world.